OK, let's go. My name is Sébastien Bachelet. I am in charge of uh, taking care of this meeting, but um, I will not be the main speaker. Of course, um, you are joining the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values uh, on the topic of uh, evolving regulation and its impact on core Internet values. Um, so core Internet value, which comprise the technical architectural values by which the Internet is built and evolves, and derives universal value that emerge from the way the Internet works. The Internet is a global medium open to all, regardless of geography or nationality. It's interoperable because it's a network of networks. It doesn't rely on a single application. It relies on open protocols such as TCP IP and BGP. It's free of any centralized control except for the needed coordination of unique ident identifiers. It's end-to-end, -end, so traffic from one end of the network to the other end of the network goes uh, in the grid. Um, it's user-centric, and users have control over what they send and receive, and it's robust and reliable. The Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Value held sessions at every previous IGF, and uh, every year there seems to be another challenge one of the most basic core internet value, its unique weakness. In 2023, the world economic having not recovered from the challenge of previous years. What was free on the internet might no longer make sense financially for company offering the service and might end up behind a paywall. What was free movement of information in the past might not be seen by government as a good thing today. What was free connectivity might not be financially sustainable any longer. What was, what was free might be blocked tomorrow for many reasons. On the one hand, there are calls for commercial operators such as telecom providers asking for a fair share of internet profits, which is gaining ground with some lawmakers. In addition to this commercial pressure, where the free mode of operation might no longer be the preferred mode of operation. Recent years have seen a lot more regulation affecting the Internet. Whether it is the UK's Online Safety Bill, the Australian Online Safety Act, the European Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act, or the US Ki Kids, Kids sorry, Online Safety Act, regulation is being drafted and rolled out by many governments very often for a good reason and good objective, but it's something we will see during this discussion. So not only is there a strong movement worldwide to implement some major structural change to the way the internet and internet services work, there is also a commercial interest from some to change the internet business model altogether. A few years ago, the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Value promoted permissionless innovation. This day, for many governments, this translates to the world wild west. Is this a fair assessment of the internet that we have been defending? Are the core uh, values that gave internet its freedom at risk? Regulation is now firmly back on the agenda. This session of the Dynamic Coalition Core Internet Values will again bring world-class experts to discuss the internet we want, each bringing their unique experience to the table. I will be briefly uh, um, um, talk about our speaker. We are here on my right, Lee Rainey. Uh, I will leave them to present themselves. It will be shorter. Uh, Jane Coffin is with us. Nick Wenner and uh, Iria Pusosa uh, are online, and Vincent is with us. I would like to thank them very much and um, give the floor, uh, if you agree, to Lee to start the discussion. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, you, Sebastian. It's wonderful to be here. I'm honored to be here. And really, my philosophy has been whenever you're in the same room with Vince Cerf, you have to start by saying thank you. <laughs> um, <You're welcome. laughs> and um, 
I come to you from 24 years of doing research with the Pew Research Center about the social and political and economic impacts of the internet. I, I, I thought I was gonna retire from Pew Research uh, this past spring, um, and I flunked retirement. So I, uh, I got a, a wonderful gig to continue on with a, a portion of the work at Elon University, which is in North Carolina, the United States. We've done a lot of work with them related to that, and I get the title professor in front of my main name now. So my mother is smiling at me in heaven and my, my children laugh at me a little bit less uh, now. Um, I wanted to start by saying sort of this, the overlying topic here is fragmentation. And so the first thing maybe to note in the sense of fragmentation is that there are 2.6 billion people who don't have the internet and don't use it. And so there is a, an enormous fragmentation at the heart of the social, political, cultural experience of the internet. Um, so I, I, just noting that is an important uh, scene setter for this conversation. Over the course of my work at Pew, though, um, it was easy to spot four different revolutions that were occurring on our watch and, and watch then the, um, the reckoning that came from those revolutions. There was a dynamic that has tightened up. It, it, there, there was usually great enthusiasm at moment uh, zero, and then the enthusiasm sometimes faded uh, as the reality of things came out. So I, I, I want to also make sure that you understand I'm going to be talking about four social, cultural, uh, and legal changes. These don't really affect how people think about the underlying principles of the internet. They love it. You poll uh, on the ideas of uh, free, open, secure, interoperable, uh, and you, you get unprecedentedly positive survey ratings about the principles that underlie what the master here built. Um, what happens, though, is that once those principles collide with culture and law and people's own um, personalities, there are ways in which uh, their enthusiasms begin to fade or their qualms begin to rise. So go through the four re revolutions relatively quickly. The first one we saw in the late 1990s, beginning in the late 1990s, was the rise of home broadband, which made people enthusiastic users of uh, internet protocols because the internet became a utility in their life. It was not a plaything anymore. As it, when you dialed up those modems, that was kind of a fun sound to hear. But when it became always on and on higher speed, people began to embrace it in the rhythms of their life. It changed the volume of information that was coming into their life, and it was th you could see the incipient ways that they became enthusiastic about, about being content creators themselves. So it was democratizing, it was uh, and doing end runs around gatekeepers, there were ways in which new kinds of communities could be built that were built around affinity and affiliation rather than localities and the physical proximity that people had to each other. And people just loved the idea that they could tell their stories without being uh, shut down or without having to cajole a gatekeeper to allow them to tell their stories. And yet, right in those early days, there were early signs that people, uh, while they liked that for themselves, they didn't like that necessarily for others who had different ideas. Um, the medical community at first was one of the, was one of the uh, initial communities to sound alarms about mis- and disinformation. They were Worried from a gatekeeper sense that people were doing end rounds or uh, end runs around their providers and getting second opinions and diagnosing themselves and things, but there was also concern that more and more misinformation and ba just bad information was getting out uh, into the world. The dangerous actors early on began to figure out how to exploit these new tools for themselves. Concern about uh, the content that was appropriate, for particularly for children, to be exposed to. I came out of the world of journalism too, so it was easy to see the warning signs of what the internet was going to be doing to mainstream journalism uh, in the culture. So that was part of the backlash. Love at first, democratizing, but also sort of concerns about some of the early uh, ways in which it was playing through the culture. Second revolution was the mobile connectivity revolution, which changed the velocity of information into people's lives. All of a sudden, their phones became another body part and another lobe in their brain. And they loved that. They love the always on, always available uh, connectivity that they have with others. They like being able to be reached by others. They like the, 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 the fact that they 
the nature of their social networks was changing even before social media really sort of came to prominence. They just could see more people in their lives and interact with more people, and they, they enjoyed that. But they, again, sort of early enough in that whole arrival of that second uh, revolution on mobile connectivity, they began to worry about the distractions that it was bringing into people's lives, the way it was disrupting their attention flows, the way that they were always available to others. They liked it in some sense. They certainly liked it when they could do outreach to others, but they didn't like necessarily being always available to others. Um, and it, it imposed news obligations on their lives. So again, there's this sort of push me, pull you, yin and yang dimension to the rise of, of this uh, second revolution. Third revolution is social media. Uh, in particularly when combined with the, um, the mo mobile connectivity revolution, it just put everything on accelerants. Their, their, their relationships in their social networks, the size and scope of their social networks, their exposure to new information and people and ideas, uh, the fact that they could share their, the adventures of their lives and even the little things in their lives um, very quickly with a push of a button and they could like and, 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 uh, and affirm things that others were doing. That was incredibly exciting to people and changed the way that they reacted to media. They, they lived their lives in, in a variety of ways. But then, relatively soon, too, became, began the first backlash wave about what, well, what's this doing, particularly to younger children and to, to especially to girls, when their when their messaging that was coming into the world was not necessarily affirming or was showing them parts of life that they um, struggled to think that they would ever have access to and things like that. The business model of the companies themselves began to raise questions about, well, how much do they really know about me and how much are they, am I being targeted and manipulated or steered or things like that. Obviously, there were concerns about harassment and hate speech and threats and all kinds of things like that and information warriors themselves taking actions in this. The fourth and final revolution or the, or that I've been privileged to watch and is unfolding in front of our very eyes and is the central topic of this idea is the artificial intelligence revolution. And, and, and clearly people uh, have very discriminating ideas about it. There are ways in which they think AI is doing wonders in their life and they anticipate even more wonders in the future. Uh, their productivity and things like that, but they're also worried about their jobs. And they're worried about bias and discrimination. They're worried about uh, their own autonomy and a way to act. And they're worried about ethical applications. I, I heard a number here. I, don't, I'm, I'm, I hope someone will fact check me on this if I'm wrong. There are at least 1,300 documented um, protocols of ethical AI that are now being circulated, God knows how many more, sort of in more private channels. But it's a sense that there's a, um, a, a, a palpable fear that um, these, these tools might uh, turn bad or they might be pulled in bad directions. So um, those are the four revolutions in the backlash. So each of them sort of have affected people's lives. But I, I also wanted to talk for a minute about other ways that I call them fragmented souls are affected uh, by these new environments. And again, a play through the social, cultural, and legal fragmentations that we're seeing. Everything that we've studied about those four revolutions shows that uh, different groups have different experiences of the revolutions. And the obvious ones that, that Pew measured every time something new happened was there are differences by class, differences by gender, differences by age, differences by race and ethnicity, and sometimes pretty significant differences by religious affiliation or non-religious affiliation. There were also differences by sort of psychographics, the way people are affected their relationship to these new tools. First of all, especially when it comes to AI, their awareness is an enormous determinant of how they think about it. The less people know, the more scared they are. And you, know, you can see how public education and other just sort of familiarization processes might ease things over time, but that, that's a big determinant now. But there are differences by, among those who are optimists and pessimists, who are those who trust and don't trust as their starting point with other individuals, extroverts and introverts, and a whole lot of other psychographics. Finally, just to make things confusing from a fragmentation sense, and uh, anybody that's trying to deal with this has to deal with the reality that different people act different ways in, in these environments. 
you know, at one moment, the context is open and affirming, and I want these things in my life, and I would like them available to me. At another moment, I don't want any access to me. I don't want my data being gathered. I don't want to be offered this transactional kind of thing. So there, there are ways in which you can't even predict at the individual level at times whether people are going to like it or not like it, which makes lawmaking hard, which makes uh, rollouts of new products and applications hard, and things like that. Um, and, and the final one is the sort of big one, which is um, there's an optimism gap that's at the center of people's uh, thinking about the fragmentation we face. They think, each individual thinks, I I'm doing okay in this environment. They like these, all of these revolutions for what they bring to their lives. Um, but they also think everybody else is messed up by them. I'm okay, you're not. So they think they're doing fine, but the society is not doing well, and they are, uh, have a split mind thinking about how to reconcile that in, in policy, in culture, in norms, and in technology. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, I will give the floor to um, Jane now, please. Hello. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jane Coffin. I've been rambling around um, the internet community and connectivity communities for about 25 years. Um, I've been in government, industry, nonprofits, and startups. My last startup was one that I didn't start it up, but I was one of the key people um, working on the startup to help fund small networks, believe it or not, in the United States, because there are a lot of networks that are not being deployed in the rural, remote, urban, unconnected, um, un and underserved areas. And it was specifically to take a look at how to fund those networks with creative, innovative funding, AKA bringing what people call um, <laughs> blended finance and impact investment back to the United States where it probably should stay for a while um, because there's a lack of connectivity and things have to change and the regulations need to be loosened up a little bit in order for that to happen. Um, during the 25 years that I've been running around, um, I've done a lot of work in what people call the global south, but the global south often doesn't call itself that. Um, the common denominator is working in those places that are less connected and potentially had fewer regulations and um, policies. So helping to bring some policy and regulatory um, sense in, in some areas and or building regulators actually to help bring in more open connectivity, uh, which was always my goal. Um, I was at the Internet Society for 10 years and spent a lot of time working on um, internet exchange points and community networks, which I'm going to focus on as, as some of the, the core internet valued entity things that we need um, related to something called invariance. And the Internet Society put out a paper um, called the Internet Invariance. And I want to read uh, the Wikipedia, if I can find it again, definition for you of invariant, which is a constant. It's something that's not changing. And so if some of the key internet invariants are um, openness, interoperability, globally uh, connected, and something that I think Vint uh, coined as permissionless innovation, I'll call it innovation without permission, those are critical things for building your internet community and building networks in um, anywhere. Um, but what we're seeing is some erosion of those key things about the openness, the interoperability, the globally connected part, which is if any, um, endpoint of, of a network can connect to another endpoint from that global interconnection. This is super important. Um, internet exchange points are a sign um, of, of some of these invariants because they bring networks together in a very neutral fashion to exchange traffic um, without a lot of rules. The rules are, of course, based in the protocols um, that come out of the Internet Engineering Task Force and some other organizations like the IEEE. Um, if you're doing wireless uh, sort of Wi-Fi uh, connectivity at the IX, but those internet exchange points that we helped develop over time gave people a neutral grounding place to exchange traffic. They were often not regulated, and it's been quite something to work over the last 15 to 10 years to make sure that they weren't regulated and to keep them open. Um, we've seen some erosion of that in different countries, and I'm not going to name the countries or where some of this is coming from, even in international organizations where they wanted to standardize the stack of equipment in IXPs, which could have created more challenges and hardened the architecture to a degree that there was less innovation when you're building the internet exchange points. The other uh, connectivity medium that we were working with so closely and I've been working with in the last couple years as well on a different level on financing them are the community networks. You can call them municipal networks 
open networks, structurally separated networks, where there's more networks writing over a network that somebody else runs, the baseline network. But with community networks, you have permi permissionless innovation to just bring in what you'd like from the community out. And if we see more regulation that prohibits community networks, I've been in international meetings where people said I was trying to stand up a terrorist network. Um, or the <laughs> and I thought, wow, okay, that's, that's a whole new uh, spin on what I'm trying to do. But, uh <laughs> and it wasn't me, and I should say, the expression we used to use was for the community, with the community, by the community. These are organic networks that are built out in places that have little last mile connectivity to no last mile connectivity, or no competitive last mile and middle mile co connectivity. So I would posit that when we keep seeing spectrum locked in, when we keep hearing people say, no, you can't have a different type of network that isn't an incumbent network or designed a certain way, um, there's, they're locking out innovation, but they're also locking out competition and they're locking people out of connectivity at a cheaper price. So if we're talking about some of the core internet values of openness, interoperability, global, uh, uh, globally connected, and innovation without permission, internet exchange points, community networks, and working with brilliant technical people in a very innovative way, which is not in a university setting at times. Um, I've worked with a lot of people in the network operator groups, which I think a lot of people don't know what those are, the NOGs. The network operator groups around the world are some of the best places where you see technical expertise transferred to other people at what I call the local, local level, where you, if you're talking about sustainability and building more internet infrastructure, it's not just people jetting in to uh, say, you do this this way. It's more of a, how do you work with local people to train local people for local connectivity? So I'm gonna stop there and just also say that, I think Lee had mentioned it, but there are some things that we're seeing with the DSA and with fair share, which by the way, I saw so much erosion of this fair share issue 20 years ago. People were calling the internet bypass because it was bypassing the traditional telco networks. So for years and years in certain fora, people were locking out the internet. They didn't want IP-based networks in their countries because it was going around the toll booth of the old uh, telco networks. Now I'm not anti-telco, full disclosure, I did work for a telco years ago, but there's room for everyone in this equation. And I'm gonna turn it over back to you, Sebastian. Thank you very much, and um, very well articulated, I think it will be useful for the uh, follow up of this meeting. Um, now we have two person online. I would like to be sure that uh, Ni, who will be the next speaker and Iria, who are available online. And Ni, please take yes, the Yes, I'm available. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Ni. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to share some views on the topic. Um, I tend to think internet means fragments. So perhaps the fragmentation is elsewhere. Uh, I'll be speaking to how Afrinic, Africa's regional internet registry uh, was affected by local legislation in Mauritius and what impact this could have on regional internet registries. Uh, there's sufficient background information at the afrinic.net website on legal cases, but take a look also as at the assisted review. I intend to present that though the legislative context is a factor, there were real other challenges, including RR transfer policies, uh, policy development you know, process attacks, cyberbullying, legal denial of service attacks on the org, and also on individuals who dare speak. Misinformation was peddled even there was cyber squat of, of the RR and so on, community poisoning and, and naturally that generated some internal governance challenges uh, surrounding the resources. Uh, however, the core, uh, the Afrini core function of administering resources to operators and end users according to a community developed policies has so far held up very well. The good news is that the multi-stakeholder approach we practice in our PDP has been resilient and several draft proposals to hijack resources did not reach consensus. Attempts to gain the uh, participation in the PDP were also thwarted and a co-chair was recalled for the first time. Uh, a brief history will put this in context. Uh, you know, 
proposal to establish was made in 97, uh, meetings in 98 in Cotonou and Afno 2000 endorsed the proposal and, and Afrinic itself was established around 2004 going to five. It received endorsements and support of several governments and uh, intergovernmental organizations, many African countries, African Union ICT ministers, OIF Francophonie, uh, e Africa Commission, UNECA, UNIS Task Force, and many others supported. So uh, the need to have it established was unquestioned. The original idea was to establish as an incorporated association, not for gain in South Africa, uh, but eventually consensus was to develop a decentralized organization uh, with headquarters in Mauritius and other operations in South Africa, Egypt, and Ghana. Uh, Afrini was blessed with generous financial resources from the government of South Africa and was actually incubated in CSR in Pretoria. And we proceeded to build the headquarters according to the consensus with additional support from the government of Mauritius. And in Mauritius, we ended up establishing as a, a private company with membership bylaws. Uh, for a decade, the shared objective was clear and was to build the foundations of internet in Africa. We lost this shared objective as we went along and interest, personal interest or self-interest began. And this began with the, uh, when Afrinic received the last slash eight of IPv4 in 2011 as per global soft landing policy. The pressures on the common objective started uh, at this time and transfer policies adopted by other regions questioned service versus property. These policies considered the V4 resources as property to LIRs, but not to the end user on whose behalf LIR justified justify the resources. Given that people have voluntarily adopted to use the identifiers, we have responsibility to manage them as public goods, not property. There were discussions on changing scope of our functions. Some say are a mere bookkeeper versus a registration service uh, agreement to be complied. The need basis policy was questioned. Out of reaching use of IP became an issue. Meanwhile, of course, board got involved in our case in resource allocation, which was a no-no. There was misappropriation of legacy V4 by founding staff, which has been addressed and most resources recalled. The consensus we had had weakened and the board got divided resulting in community disagreements. We've had three CEOs, 2004, 15 and 19 and none since 2022. In 2021, Afrinic initiated uh, a resource members assisted review according to the RSA. The membership application has compliance requirements where members shall do specific things as well as consequences if member is not compliant. In the review, some members accepted, some had fudged documents. One member who had received more than slash nine in four allocations in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, refused to comply, saying Afrinic is a bookkeeper, has no rights. But the member signed the RSA. The member in question also has no ASN and no V6. Afrinic followed the RSA and applied the consequences by recalling resources. The member did not seek arbitration, denied Afrinic rights to assess his compliance and started litigations. There have been over 55 cases from five companies and directors. A commercial dispute therefore had erupted between the member and Afrinic. In that year, there were, in 2021, there were a total of 28 cases with member initiating 26 and Afrinic only two. 18 of cases were completed with 12 set aside, four withdrawn by a member and two null and void or by agreement. There were 11 injunctions, three stay of executions, four claims, and one contempt. The claims were to amend uh, our register to make the person a, like a director, whereas he's not been elected, demanding $1.8 billion, demanding Afrinic on use uh, V4 resources, 
garnishing the company's assets, def de claiming defamation and so on. The cases seem frivolous and designed to overwhelm attention, financial resources, and stress governance. These member bullied community members with defamation suits in their countries if they dared mention a name on mailing lists. However, the substantive case on violations of the RSA by member has not yet been heard. One of other consequent uh, cases damaged board column and could not appoint lawyers for court cases to defend Afrini nor her CEO. A recent court order has appointed an official receiver to hold elections to restore governance at Afrini. In summary, someone saw a loophole and decided to harass company, attack the weak part of the IRS system. This started with review of compliance. Then we saw abuse of legislation in cumulative attacks in a capital market economy. Member created a number of confusion, offering alternate RRR based on brokerage and lots of social media misinformation. On the other hand, Afrinic is well positioned in the substance. Even injunction on transfer policy has completed, has not granted. The multi-stakeholder in the PDP was strong enough to resist abuse of open participation. We have had support from all RRRs, ICANN, ISOC, governments, members, and community at large. We, we just had AIS 2023 organized by AFNOG and AFRINIC and hosted by Zadna in Johannesburg, South Africa. We are organizing community for what to do in the future and we're privileged to receive video message from Vincef and Ambassador Amandeep Gill, UN Secretary General Envoy on Technology. During the opening ceremony, the Deputy Minister of Ministry of Communication and Digital Technology, Philip Mapulani, did not mince words when he called the heist a new colonial conquest. The V4, V6, and ASN resources are for internet development in Africa, and we uh, and would not would be difficult to change the purpose. Africa did not complete the decentralization or uh, decentralized organization it planned. It could also not get diplomatic protections it had sought. Ironically, Afrini went to Mauritius for business stability, for a technology company, but now going through litigation that comes from capital market. We should not take internet for granted and protect it for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ni. Uh, very interesting, uh, useful, and uh, um, I am sure that a lot of people in this room and around the world um, support you and uh, the people who try to solve the case of Afrinic, because we all need Afrinic. Um, and now uh, I will give the floor to, uh, I guess it's uh, Iria. Can you show us, show on the screen and, and take the floor, please? We, you need to open your mic because you are muted for the moment, as I can see. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. Um, mm, I kind of uh, go back to what uh, Lee was saying at the beginning. We had a kind of wave of uh, uh, panics of uh, uh, backlash, as he said. And now we are facing all those. So uh, we are fight, uh, We are in a moment in we were we are listening. We are hearing a lot. Of, a lot of uh, voices saying we need to regulate. We need to regulate fast because something some serious harm upon us on, on the internet. I'm kind of concerned about these uh, these reactions and uh, the, this demand for quick uh, response. Uh, for, because most of the time this, uh, these regulations don't over under pressure uh, are kind of ill-designed and they may break the internet. And that was what, this is what, what we are uh, concerned at the moment. I believe that we need to do um, more research on, on the issues uh, uh, before us, 
define precisely what the problems are and how the problems we are trying to solve and not something so big is, is impossible to, 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 to understand and assess the trade-offs between different policies and the way in which uh, there are suitable technical implementations for those policies. And when we try to add to regulate too fast, maybe we, we lost that. Um, in the research I, I conducted uh, recently in the FR lab, we were focusing on knowing the internet as a whole, but in messaging apps. Uh, well, we, we were trying to, to, to add in, in response to demands of regulating this ad, particularly uh, uh, trying to uh, in, introduce content moderation in encrypted uh, messaging apps. That was kind of the, the, the call we were listening here in the United States, people concerned about disinformation and foreign influence operations, people concerned about notification of terrorists, violent extremists, species that may drive atrocities and child sexual abuse material. Um, oh, most of the claims had the idea of this is happening because these messages that are encrypted. And so police this content and saw those harms. So this was it's, it's, it's pretty much the uh, say a generalization, a simplification of the public conversation, but it's what we're hearing. So in our research, we find that well, it's not the case. So most of the most of the the content we see is in, in message with us is overwhelmingly positive and there are also so so it's, it's useful, helpful for individuals, communities and societies. Uh, but this thinking about harms is what dominates the public conversation and will take us they get to the pressure we are seeing over the UK online safety bill and the US keeps online safety ad in which most of the pressure is you know, we need to find a way to moderate content in encrypted apps because everything running there is is negative for the society is harmful for the society uh, what what the part of the world we, we were we were doing here and the different lab was trying to to show how or how the content there was uh, a variation of content with different purpose and most of the English was positive, but also how different ways to, to deal with this harmful content that certainly exists, we doesn't need to break encryption, we doesn't need to uh, uh, establish uh, impose uh, content moderations who will be uh, undermining encryption. So that that uh, that is the, that is the focus of that that, that uh, recent research we, we are doing here. Um, uh, in part, uh, our conclusion is it is one of the issues we sometimes get out of the conversation is how these uh, policies uh, for the flow of data use of uh, uh, internet-based applications. Uh, don't consider that this is a transnational flow of data and it's a, it's a territorial scope of affected platform operations and so maybe well-intended uh, uh, regulation in one country will be affected uh, profoundly negatively in other countries in which rule of law is not as, 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 as it's not as a norm. So um, the, the, the work we are trying to do is try to uh, find ways for addressing the problems existing in the platform without uh, breaking the fundamentals of the of, of the of the use in this case uh, breaking the creation uh, in, uh, we were focusing a message ad, but as we know see so we go after uh, a creature is not needed in in in, in message ad sooner or rather than later, some people are going to say uh, encryption is not needed in the internet and we need to uh, get rid of that because there are all, all the harmful contents uh, running in the internet. So this is pretty much what we are looking at at, at this moment. This is a, we, a, we see, I see it's a, it's a period uh, for the internet as a whole when we uh, let this conversation escalate uh, and trying to undermine, in this case, encryption. In other case, could be a, another, another, another value, another core principle of the integrity of the internet uh, as as a as a space for uh, uh, communications. Um, um, do this shared concern we had in this legal. It's the pressure for uh, quick regulation, 
no, no well defined the regulation, no, no well, no well intended regulation, is part of what we uh, are being trying to to get into the conversation at the moment, trying to find solutions to uh, to on hand can ensure the respect of human rights, the rule of law, within the principles of necessity and proportionality, without uh, attacking uh, the the aspects where uh, we consider core for the uh, the the functioning of internet-based communications and internet integrity. Thank you very much, uh, Mirja. And now, uh, last but not least, uh, Vincent, please. First of all, thank you for... Okay, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to join you uh, in this session. I think uh, all the preamble just tells you that um, many of the times when we try to fashion rules to uh, make the system function uh, in a way that's safe and secure, we often end up with unexpected uh, side effects, and some of them you've just heard from Nii, for example. Um, I think what's happened over the course of the last decade or so is that the openness of the Internet, which was relatively safe, was a consequence of the people who were using it. In the very early part, the people who used it were the people who were building it. And for the most part, they didn't have any interest in destroying it or abusing it. They just wanted to make it work. But as time has gone on and as it has become commercially available, then more and more of the world's population have access to this. And their motivations are not exactly the same as what the original engineering teams had in mind. They're interested in using the Internet for... Uh, for their own purposes, and there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. I mean, business wants to use the Internet in order to improve business, uh, to grow their businesses. But there are people who are on the Internet who would like to exploit their ability to um, amplify their voices, to amplify their messages, to deliver malware, to deliver phishing attacks, uh, or denial of service attacks, whatever else is motivating them. Uh, and governments are, uh, have, over the past decade or so, recognized that these hazards are beginning to arise out of whatever motivations. And so they try to uh, enact laws that will protect people uh, using the Internet. Uh, and that's an also an understandable motivation. Now, I must admit to you that there are some countries that are more interested in protecting the regime than they are in protecting the, uh, the citizens. Uh, interestingly enough and difficult, the, the difficulty is that the same mechanisms that might be used to protect the citizens are also useful for inhibiting uh, legitimate uh, freedom of speech or other kinds of activities that many of us would consider um, reasonable. And so that we now have a conundrum, which is that in our interest in protecting the safety and security and privacy of the Internet, we may interfere with our ability to hold parties accountable for the bad behaviors that they exhibit on the network. And that is um, uh, threading the needle in some sense. Perhaps those of us who live in democracies will have to recognize that the uh, authoritarian governments will in fact use the tools that, uh, that we would argue are needed to um, imbue citizens with rights to inhibit those rights. And I'm not sure that we have the uh, freedom uh, to inhibit that or to prevent that from happening. What that means is that the Internet will not be the same everywhere that, that, that we look. You see this happening where Internets get shut down from time to time because the regime believes that it either is necessary to protect the regime or they may even believe that it's necessary to protect citizens from uh, harmful uh, misinformation and disinformation. This leads to uh, a zeal uh, in the legislative corridors to pass laws intended to protect the people's interests. Uh, and I'll, let me just set aside the, the laws that are passed to protect the interest of the regimes. I just focus on the more democratic environments. What can happen, however, is that in the, uh, the intent of those laws may be laudable, no pun intended, um, but they may also have side effects. So one possible example is that if, um, if the law requires 
uh, 24-hour response to the removal of harmful content. First of all, it may turn out to be literally impossible to cite one statistic that you're all familiar with, uh, the YouTube application at Google receives somewhere between 400 and 500 hours of video per minute uploaded into the system. I have no idea how many hours of video are exported per minute you know, by users who are trying to download content. Um, it's not possible for uh, that, in that content to be vetted uh, manually. We don't have enough people uh, to do that. And so we rely on technical means, uh, machine learning mechanisms, which we all know are imperfect. And so not only will they not work 100% of the time, but they won't catch 100% of the problems. And they may catch things that aren't problems but look like problems because the algorithms don't know the difference. Uh, asking a company the size of Google to do something is one thing, but asking a small, medium-sized enterprise to uh, carry out the same kind of um, uh, filtering uh, may inhibit that small enterprise from ever existing, let alone uh, growing. So uh, we have these undesirable side effects of well-intended laws that may prevent us from building the internet that, that we all would like to have. We also, someone mentioned earlier, I guess it was Jane, that there were laws that were passed in the U.S. anyway, uh, the uh, telcos that didn't want competition from community networks were able to get laws passed in, in, in the states to inhibit the building of community networks on the grounds that if a municipality wanted to build a network, it was the government uh, interfering with freedom, uh, uh, com competing with private enterprise that ignored the fact that the typical arrangement would be that the community would actually have a contract with a private uh, uh, entity to go build the municipal network and operate it, but that was sort of ignored in that zeal to argue the, uh, the other case. So I'm uh, actually quite worried that uh, the these are not simple problems to solve and that at the Internet Governance Forum, where we've spent years literally contemplating some of these problems, that we have a kind of responsibility to try to help uh, the legislators and the regulators come to reasonable conclusions about protecting human interests, while at the same time recognizing that there are responsibilities associated with the use of the Internet. In the previous session, um, I'm, it, came, it, it occurred to me to remind people about the social contract and uh, Rousseau's observation that uh, along with safety and security, which people are looking for in their social environment, that they have obligations not to abuse their freedoms. And so my freedom to punch somebody in the nose kind of stops about you know, one, one centimeter away from Sebastian's nose. And if, if I... My, my freedom existed up to that point, but as soon as I complete the action now, I have now violated his rights. So we have uh, still some work to do, and I think especially in the IGF context, we have an obligation to help the legislators and the regulators to find a way forward that preserves as much of the utility and value of the Internet as possible while at the same time um, protecting people from harm. And one particular thing which we have valued over time, I think, is anonymous use of the Internet. You shouldn't have to be known to just do a Google search, for example. Uh, however, if you are going to use the Internet for harmful purposes, eventually, we, I think we would generally agree we would want, want those parties to be identified. Well, this gets to uh, the notion that, of accountability Many of the laws that are being passed are uh, attempts by the legislators to articulate how to hold parties accountable for their behavior, whether that's a private sector entity or an individual or uh, a, a whole country. In order to hold parties accountable, you have to be able to identify them. So now we have a tension between privacy and the ability to reveal a party in the event that we believe that party is misbehaving. 
Um, the, there is currently, as many of you know, an attempt to draft a cybercrime treaty. And there is a considerable amount of debate deciding on what's a cybercrime. Uh, in some cases, you could argue that every crime that already exists can also use a computer to execute the crime. Therefore, all crimes must be cybercrimes. That's not a good syllogism, and some of us are arguing that we should be more uh, cautious about um, the treaty being focused specifically on things that you could not uh, do uh, without the use of a computer and a network. That's still in debate, uh, and so we haven't completed that yet. So my uh, bottom line on all of this is that in our attempt to make the Internet a safe and secure environment, we are going to have to uh, accept that some of the principles that we enjoyed in the early days of the Internet may no longer be fully attainable. And in particular, I would argue that accountability forces us into making parties identifiable at need. And I will offer just one very weak analogy, uh, which some of you have heard before, I suspect. Um, when you uh, get a, a license plate on the car, it's usually just a random collection of letters and numbers, and it looks um, like gobbledygook to us. But there are parties who have the authority to look that license plate up and identify the owner of the car, which, by the way, may not be the driver of the car, and that's also an important observation. But this piercing of the veil of anonymity or pseudonymity um, is um, may turn out to be essential to uh, introducing accountability into the system. Uh, some of you have also heard uh, my argument that agency is another element of all this. We need to provide agency to individuals, corporations, and even countries to protect their interests, uh, which might mean, for example, the use of end-to-end -end cryptography in order to maintain confidentiality. And arguments are often made that end-to-end -end cryptography is harmful because it means it's harder for law enforcement to detect that there is um, misbehavior on the network. And I sort of draw the line there and argue that end-to-end -end cryptography for the protection of confidentiality is extremely important. The idea that uh, you have a back door into the cryptographic system almost certainly guarantees eventually that information will uh, be released and then no one will have any confidentiality, confidentiality at all. Last point, um, people who are um, focused on the anonymous use of the Internet may sometimes forget that strong authentication of your identity might turn out to be helpful to you and that you should be adopting mechanisms that make it hard for other people to pretend to be you. Because if it's too easy for them to do that, they may in fact uh, take actions on your behalf that you didn't authorize. And so strong authentication might, I hope, become a norm in the system uh, where it's needed in order to make sure that uh, you protect yourself against other people taking actions that you didn't authorize. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop there, but I hope this feeds a little bit of the thinking for the debate which should follow. Thank you very much, Vint. Um, Sebastian Machel is speaking. Just, uh, I would like to pick up one of your, your points. It's when you remind us that uh, IGF could be useful and uh, the exchange we have here and in the other room are not just to talk, but also it's, it's to talk, but to exchange between uh, various stakeholders. Um, and that's an important point here also today. Uh, now I would like to uh, open the floor for question. You have a mic in the middle of the room. Just uh, queue there and, and talk, give comments or questions. And um, if there is uh, the same uh, online, please uh, do it. Yes, uh, uh, Sebastian uh, Alejandro Pisanti here, moderator online. There's Deborah Allen Rogers' uh, hand up as well. Okay, Deborah, go ahead, please. Thank you. So, you Deborah, you can ask your question. If you can open your mic and uh, eventually your camera too will be great, like that we can see you. For the moment, your microphone is closed, as I can see. How many engineers does it take to turn on a microphone? 
maybe only one, but the system may be so unresponsive. Okay, may maybe, um, okay. M maybe, uh, Alessandro, you, you may be willing to start and we will try to solve the, the problem with Deborah. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll make a very brief comment right now. Uh, as uh, the, the, the work of the Dynamic Coalition on uh, Core Internet Values is concerned with uh, the way uh, different uh, things, and this year it's regulations mostly, uh, may impinge on the, on these core values, uh, assuming, of course, that they are mostly the technical principles with which the, the internet was built. And uh, what we see from some of the regulation proposals is that may, may actually uh, do away or damage seriously things like uh, the universality of reach of the internet. Uh, they may be achieved by reducing interoperability I'm very concerned, for uh, for example, this is does not mean not to do it, but find a way to do it uh, with what Pint has said, for example, for stronger authentication or for stronger identification, we may find ourselves uh, needing uh, to add devices to the system or some governments or banks or, or such entities may decide that you need to have an extra device, uh, maybe also on their network to do this authentication that open standards like uh, PKI will not work. So that's the kind of concern that we have to look into the, let's extract a, 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 a list of these things for, for now and see how they can be made to work uh, or research over the next months. Uh, these, these are key points uh, that we're looking at. But I'll, I'll leave the floor to other participants. Uh, Deborah says that it's not allowing her to open. I'm, I, I'm, I'm already trying to unmute. Hello, uh, hello. There you are. I'm here, but I, I would like to be on camera, but you all see my face uh, in the picture. So I just want to say um, hello to everyone and thank you very much. Um, I will lower my hand also. And um, what I wanted to say was a couple of things. I'm from New York City, I live in The Hague. Um, my name is Deborah Allen Rogers, as you see, and I have a digital fluency lab here called Find Out Why. So I wanted to direct my question. Oh, here we go. It looks like I can start my video. Okay, hello everyone. Um, okay, so hello from The Hague. Um, I wanted to direct my question at Jane and also at Vint, um, every, anyone else who might want to join in, but um, in particular, the two of you. Um, one is the father of the internet, and secondly, as um, a woman who just gave us a lot of really good intel about NOGs, for example. Do either of you or do anyone on the panel spend time working directly with um, Finland and Estonia on e-governance. I do some work with them and they've developed these models and they've been putting them in place for a good 20 years for e-governance and have answers to many of the questions I see that we struggle with here in Europe and that we struggle with in the United States. And, be, and the last point I'll make is because they stay sort of under the radar screen, oftentimes their, their um, designs are sort of overlooked, I've noticed, in all the work that I do with um, various Euro European internet forums, et cetera. So um, I was in DC this summer, and we talked a lot about it at the Trans-Atlantic uh, Partnership meetings. But I did want to raise it in this, in this venue as well about um, e-governance in Estonia and in Finland, and XROAD in particular. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Question in the room. We okay. We can we can start with few questions and then. Uh, but it's up to you. If you want, we can start, Deborah. If you want to, to take the floor and uh, and give some answer, and then uh, I will ask Vint also and the other uh, participants. The and question does relate to the same thing. Then, then go ahead. Uh, do you do you hear me? Yeah. Try the microphone. Okay. So Martin Bottomon, and, and indeed the, the big thing I'm struggling with is that this internet needs to be more and more secure, more and more reliable. We, can, we should be able to rely on it, and we're working on that. And now one of the elements is indeed identification. And would you consider, for instance, anonymity as a core internet value, or is that something different? Uh, 
how can we uh, get to a kind of standard where you combine security with anonymity via a kind of trusted service or something? Is that something where, where we can go? And I think it very much complements to, to uh, Alejandro's uh, concern and what the lady just said, uh, identity as used in these governments. Thank you. Uh, I go actually ahead. would like to respond to that specifically. Uh, for a long time, uh, I had the view that anonymity was uh, a right that we should have and that you should be able to use the internet without identifying yourself. What we discovered, at least what I believe we discovered, is that anonymity uh, creates uh, opportunity for really severe and bad behavior. If people think that there are no consequences for their harmful behaviors on the net, then they will continue to execute those bad behaviors. And so absolute anonymity is, in my view, not necessarily, uh, a, should not be a core value. And I, I'm surprised at my change in position, but uh, having seen too much bad behavior that's shielded by anonymity, I now believe that uh, accountability is more important. That doesn't mean that you um, have to identify yourself to use all of the Internet's features. That's not what I'm arguing. But I am saying that uh, we should tolerate um, mechanisms that allow for discovery. And, wh and while I say that, I absolutely understand that the look, viewing this through the lens of a democratic society versus an authoritarian one, you get very different answers from the standpoint of an authoritarian government, the ability to identify parties is harmful to that party's interests. Um, and yet, if, if, if we don't allow for that kind of discovery, then all of our interests are harmed by the bad behaviors that are not accountable and therefore uh, difficult to inhibit. You could say, well, can't we inhibit the bad behaviors just by using technology? Uh, can't we use machine learning to filter all the bad stuff out? And the answer is, as far as we can tell, that doesn't work. Um, either it doesn't work because it fails to filter, or it filters the wrong thing, and therefore people's rights are harmed because of that. And so this is going to be a, a relatively imperfect uh, outcome, but I am persuaded at the moment that um, protecting people's interests and protecting people from harm is really important. Uh, we can say, though, that there are certain actions that, that where we recognize that anonymity is important because if you're identifiable, then there could be really harmful side effects, whistleblowing being a good example of that. But I would argue with you that even in the whistleblowing case, the most traditional means of handling that are that a trusted party receives the blown whistle and may in fact need to know who is blowing the whistle but is obligated to keep that party's identity anonymous. Um, and that's one of the ways in which you thread the needle uh, between anonymity and identifiability uh, and accountability. So I'd be very interested, of course, if people have arguments against this proposition that an pure anonymity should not be an absolute core value anymore. Thank you, um, Vin. Before Vin, uh, can, I, can, I, can I pick up on that, Sebastian, for a second? Uh, go ahead, but to help uh, our yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. Very briefly. And, uh, 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 and uh, to, to further the point that was made by, by Deborah uh, as well, uh, how big an architectural change would this be? Uh, we, we have assumed for many years that the only identifier that the internet gives you is actually, I mean, that's proper from the internet, is the IP address, and everything else comes from the edge. So how big of an architectural change would that be? And then, of course, how scalable would that be? The case of Estonia, I think, is very brilliant, but has a, a, a limitation of scale in the way you can establish trust within a small uh, society or going further out. Sorry, so it's just to, to, to extend this question. Thank you. Could, could I respond on the Estonian side? Because uh, the one thing which impresses me about Estonia is that 100% of the population is registered for strong authentication, 100%. And they can do that in part because it's a million and a half people. When you get to 300 million or 600 million or 1.4 billion, it gets harder. 
uh, India has, has introduced the Aadhaar system, which is attempting to strongly authenticate parties for their benefit. But everyone sitting in the room and those on, online can also recognize the potential risk factors uh, of being able to identify people by biological metrics and things like that. Um, and you could see how that can be abused as well. So we're, this is a peculiar tension that I think is not 100% resolvable. But as I say, I believe that accountability may turn out to be far more important than absolute anonymity. Thank you, Jane. And then I will go to Ghana IDF Remote Hub and then back to Deborah. Jane, please. I would, I'll be very brief. Um, Deborah, we've worked with a variety of governments around the world to work with a variety of governments around the world. So, But if there are some really great practices that we can um, glean from you, that would be exciting. Um, I wanted to pick up really quickly on a point that Vint made about the IGF having an obligation. Um, and I think, Vint, that point, one of the points uh, I want to extrapolate from that is to help find a way forward with governments to have inclusive multi-stakeholder inclusion in the policy making and regulation. We start to exclude um, civil society, the te technical community, academia. It's, it's very much um, not going to lead to a better regulatory and policy regime and environment. And if we don't, the law of unintended consequences may prevail here where we may force centralization a bit more. Some governments may force centralization in their lawmaking um, if they aren't including some of the smaller networks, the other uh, instances like uh, internet exchange points and others in the conversation and lock out multi-stakeholder um, inclusion. So I just wanted to put that out there before so we ended. So Jane, uh, but since this is also supposed to be entertainment for you, <laughs> so now we'll have this little <laughs> debate back and forth. You're not saying, I hope, or, or are you trying to argue that the point I'm making that an absolute anonymity may no longer be a core value in the interests of the people who use the internet? Your, your argument about governments and multi-stakeholder uh, policy making I, I, I don't understand is, it is an argument against my proposition. It is an argument for uh, the utility of multi-stakeholder perspective in the formulation of policy. Uh, and I hope that what I've been saying is not in un unintentionally misinterpreted no. as against multi-stakeholderism. I am a complete fan of that, believe that it should be a part of every government's normal practices. So I see these as two very distinct things. Yep. Uh, that's also uh, a correct interpretation of what you were saying. Okay. I think you're helping us point out that the obligation of the IGF is, and it's the uniqueness of the multi-stakeholder model in the IGF, to work with governments to make sure that whether it's a discussion on anonymity or interoperability and more networks being interconnected openly, is that that's more robust policy making regulation comes through that multi-stakeholder uh, discussion. So in fact, uh, th there's a simultaneous obligation, I think, mm -hmm. of members of the IGF who care about these things to engage with governments. We mm -hmm. need to help the governments appreciate why the IGF is so important to them yeah. as <laughs> they try to formulate policy. Lee. The striking thing for so many years about tech policy stuff was that it was pre-partisan, uh, both here it's pr and in Europe in particular. The dynamic we're talking about now, though, has hints and allegations of being swept into partisan polarization. I don't think there's the kind of consensus now that there might have been five or six years ago in the, in the mainstream, in the parties, about whether anonymity is, uh, shouldn't be a, a core value. Uh, and I, you, you see signs of it. Um, in, the, in the populist mainstream party dynamics of Europe as well. So this is all, it, again, to, to, the, to the theme of the, of the day, this is all organic and moving and fluid and um, it's hard to settle, settle things in that environment. Okay, let's go back to the um, participants and uh, Ghana, please. I hope that we can hear you. I know that we can see you, I s at least in my computer. But go ahead, please, Ghana, and then uh, Deborah. And then I will go to the room and then to the next speakers online. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kwame Ute Joseph, speaking from Pentecost University, Ghana. Um, whilst we look at the core values of the internet, 
I want to um, ask this question that um, with the VPN, virtual, that's virtual private networks, people use these um, networks to bypass restrictions on the internet to fraud and infringe on sensitive data of others. I want to ask um, what can be done to protect individual content on the internet once we look at, uh, I mean, um, what can the government do or what can we do to um, help protect the content of individuals on the internet? Thank you very much. Thank you, Gana. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Bint. So uh, I think that I've re reached the conclusion that cryptography is our friend uh, in all of this. Uh, for example, there are, are many places that will insist that information about their citizens must be uh, kept in the geophysical boundary of the country in the belief, uh, or at least they make the argument that somehow that makes it safer. Um, in some cases, uh, the motivation behind that is to demand access to the information to the par uh, from the parties who hold the information within the geopolitical boundary of that government. We hear the term data sovereignty, for example, to argue that data about citizens shouldn't leave the country. I will make the argument that when you insist on that, you actually lose uh, reliability. Uh, at Google, for example, we replicate data across our data centers, and we also encrypt it so that no matter where it goes, when it's at rest, it's encrypted. Uh, when it's transmitted, it's encrypted. We even have a situation or a, a provision for the possibility that the users hold the keys to the data. And so we don't, uh, no matter where we put it, it is under the control of the users. So my argument here would be to transport, be that transporter data flows and encryption allow you to place data anywhere in the internet and protect it as long as you manage your keys properly. Now that is a huge challenge because key management is a non-trivial exercise. And in fact, it's one of the reasons that I did not uh, push public key crypto into the internet for a while, because while it was being developed, the people who were doing the development were graduate students. They're not the first category of people that I would rely on for high quality key management. They, they, and there's not, it's not that they're stupid or something, it's just that they get distracted by silly things like PhD dissertations and final exams. So today we have an obligation to help people manage keys and cryptography and, and to protect their interests and to help them strongly authenticate themselves. So uh, I, I'm uh, of the view that um, that's the correct way to handle data protection and not to argue that its physical location is, is the ideal um, protection mechanism, but rather cryptography. Thank you, Vint. Uh, Deborah, please. Uh, maybe I need to do something. Wait a second. Yeah, now I guess. Yeah. Try again. There we go. Here I am. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. that gr that's a quotable quote. Excellent. Cryptography is our friend, for sure. And uh, to add to um, the question that was just asked about how do we protect human rights or personal rights or personal privacy, Cryptography is our friend and thinking about all the different ways in which um, it can be scaled. This is what I wanted to say about the point you made about a million point seven users or something like that in Estonia and the cultural sort of, I think the cultural context of that and the idea that um, now that we're on this online, offline, no line world, scale is such a, a, a reference, it's such a, um, it's changing this concept of what we can do with scale at the push of a button. And so I speak also to the CEO of X-Road who's based in Finland and he talks about a different cultural reference in Finland, one that's a lot more conservative than the one that was in Estonia 20 years building their brand new internet systems and the governance for their banking and their voting and et cetera. So I just wanna make this point. I was a clothing designer in the eighties and nineties when the entire world existing through a pandemic called AIDS, moving into global manufacturing, all going to China. This is not, and I'm in New York at 9-11, of course, this is not the first time I've been through these sorts of drastic transitions. 
as you know, Vint, I mean, I hear um, George Carlin's voice somewhere in the background of your voice as well, talking about, and for anyone listening, please look up George Carlin. You'll see why. Um, so thank you about the crypto cryptography as our friend comment. And please can, if you all want to speak about, or at least think about this, um, rethinking about this idea of scale and smaller societies that are doing things. Because test samples are small and it's scaling a functional test sample is what works. And so we have to think about these societies. I'm living in, in a very highly governed, uh, functional society here in the Netherlands now for three years, it's different than living in other cultures that are not highly functional at this moment. I say that in reference to something that you mentioned, Lee. So um, I don't want to actually go on record as mentioning which society, but non-functional and functional looks very different. And I think the functionality is the point, not the size of the scale model. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you, Deborah. We, we have 12 minutes to go. We have one question in the room and uh, one speaker in the online and uh, Alessandro Pisanti will read uh, some comments online too. Therefore, let's go to the room speaker, please. Hi, Roger. Uh, is this working? Yep. Roger Dingledine, Tor Project. So this word anonymity is, uh, is one that I, I think about a lot. Uh, I actually find the word anonymity to be confusing when people are thinking about it. I usually use the word communications metadata security or a securing communications metadata. That doesn't trip very well off the tongue, does it? Fair enough, but the reason why I mention this is thinking about one of the ways that we've managed to, to, to thread the needle to, to manage both of these is looking at it from different layers. So if you tell people Tor is an anonymity tool, then they say, oh, well, I guess I can't use Facebook. But it makes perfect sense to log into Facebook over Tor, you're getting to choose what of your communications metadata you want to reveal. So by default, when you're reaching them, you don't automatically blurt out your identity. You then get to choose what you tell them. And Facebook doesn't care where you are, they care who you are. And what they mean by that is Facebook level, Facebook application layer of who you are. So you log into Facebook, and from there, at the platform level, there's a completely separate question about anonymity versus accountability. Do you need your real name? And so on. But the separating those means that at the network layer, you don't automatically identify yourself, yet, as you say, it might be beneficial in a societal way or a platform way or a community way to choose to identify yourself uh, at a different layer. So that, that layering mechanism um, is one, I don't want to say that it solves everything, but it's a, it, I think it helps us get closer to the answer. Uh, of course, we don't want anonymity for everybody all the time, no matter what, but we want to give people the choice of who they tell yeah. about them. I think that's a really good point, and I appreciate the uh, layering argument, which uh, makes good sense to me. Uh, you'll notice that uh, other elements of the internet d design, especially the domain name system, has introduced mechanisms like DOH and DOT and so on or, uh, in order to protect information at certain layers of the architecture while revealing it at others. And your point about choice is very well taken. Thank you, uh, Vind, and thank you for your question. Um, Shiva. Um, Please, and, and then Alessandro, I will give you the floor. Uh, I need to... Okay, go ahead, uh, uh, Shiva. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Jane was talking about uh, the internet exchange points and uh, the neutrality, the intended neutrality. As far as I know, some of the internet exchange points have a commercial business model. Uh, and uh, how far are they away from uh, the intended neutrality? And also, if an internet exchange point can theoretically be non-neutral, can they also become tools in the hands of uh, governments, good and bad governments, to indirectly regulate the internet or to control the internet in a certain way. And the positive question on internet exchange point is, uh, is uh, 
is there any design to um, think of an internet exchange point for interplanetary networks, uh, probably with a uh, with a peculiar bridge to um, give a one-way uh, connectivity to the global internet. Thank you. So Shiva, that's a. I'm going to start with your last point about internet exchange points and interplanetary, and I can feel Vent too <laughs> right next to me, because I think are you still the chair of the interplanetary working group or the? No, I'm not. I'm not the chairman. I'm a member of the board, exactly. but I participate uh, <laughs> with them. Yes. So you should check out a session on Thursday that Joanna Kulisa will be running um, with respect to. Well, I think that's data governance. But in any event, there's a paper that Jana, Joanna Kulisa and Berna Gur have written, and it was funded by the Internet Society Foundation. I'm not. Uh, you know, this isn't a an advertisement for this foundation, even though I worked at ISOC before. But the paper they put together, and another paper put together by the Internet Society by Dan York, who also will be on the panel on Thursday, um, talks about the potential for exchange points in space with LEOs, L low Earth orbiting satellites. Sorry, I should be clearer. Um, it could be a very interesting thing, and I and and then the question is, who can participate? You know, who's running the network uh, as far as the LEO constellation itself? Um, is there neutrality if it's only one entity company that can control all the traffic exchange, or is it only their traffic? It's very complicated right now with cross-border connectivity to potential. Um, if you have a transmission going down into one country that beams up to another satellite that's going to beam down into another country, the whole concept of negotiating cross-border connectivity issues <laughs> is complicated yeah. um, wildly. But um, I'll stop there for a minute, uh, Shiva, and then turn to Vint on the interplanetary. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me, just setting aside the spatial uh, notion for a moment, internet exchange points uh, on the ground are really powerful tools because they allow for connectivity, efficient kinds of connectivity among networks. But here's a scary thought. Suppose that you're in a, a regime where the government runs the exchange points and there it is required that all traffic between networks go through government-operated exchange points which uh, which might uh, lead to surveillance of the kind that you didn't want. That takes us back to cryptography being your friend. Uh, and once again, you can imagine regimes that don't want you know encrypted traffic to be running through the exchange points. With regard to uh, putting uh, exchange points or data centers in space, mm -hmm. one of the um, observations I would make is that th those typically require maintenance. And so we may have some difficulty getting people up there to uh, to do maintenance. Um, I, I'm sure everybody in this room does understand and appreciate that the internet doesn't run itself. Right. There are millions of people who, as a daily job, help keep the internet functioning. Uh, otherwise, it would break pretty quickly. And I wish that were not the case. I wish that our designs had been even more robust. But uh, to be quite frank, they require a lot of attention. Yeah, and Shiva, to quickly just answer your question, I was referring to the the IXs that are the neutral bottom up, um, you know, not managed by governments. But to Vince's point, there are exchanges where traffic is monitored. Um, that's just required by the countries, um, and so that's something that does happen. And I'm with Vince on the encryption, the crypto side, um, in that. Not cryptocurrency, but encryption. Um, <laughs> I don't really care about cryptocurrencies right now. Um, I probably should in the future, but. <laughs> Um, as far as the commercial IXs, that's a different uh, instantiation of exchange point, and they serve a certain purpose, but they, they're not the bottom-up uh, neutral exchanges that I, was meant I, ha I meant to be more clear about. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now I give the floor to um, Alessandro. He will give us uh, last feedback on the online, and then I will give one minute to each of the uh, five speakers to conclude, because we will be late in any case. Uh, go ahead, uh, Alessandro, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I'm not going to speak for myself right now. I'm going to read two comments. One comes from Iria uh, on the chat. Uh, she says, uh, choosing to identify is different from being forced to reveal your personal identification data in order to access the internet or an app. And I side totally with that statement. And the other one comes from the Abuja IGF Remote Hub in Abuja, Nigeria, I think. Uh, Ni mentioned that Afrinic is registered as a private entity in Mauritius. 
Hasn't this status contributed to the barrage of court cases the regional RIR now faces? While a good number of technical organizations are registered as non-profits, shouldn't regional and global technical organizations that govern the internet be accorded internet governmental organization status? Those, those are the two points from online. Thank you very much. Um, we need to run to another meeting, therefore um, may I suggest that um, if Ni is still online, I want to take uh, one minute uh, the microphone. Uh, sure. Um, the answer to the question of the, uh, the nature of a uh, registration private company with bylaws, I think the answer is no, um, because it has really no no bearing. A commercial dispute uh, can occur even between nonprofit and members. So uh, I don't see that as the direct thing. This is a case of some a member who is violating you know, rules and is refusing to be disciplined and is beginning to abuse the, the, the legal system uh, by generating a barrage of, of, of court cases at the same time uh, trying to break into people's uh, account by offering them money and, and so on. So it's, it's just a bad case that needs to be dealt with as such uh, because it, it tried to invade the policy process, it failed, it tried to force uh, a co-chair and the co-chair got recalled. If you look at all these things, one organization, why generate 20 something cases in a year? If you really are doing proper business, why would you have so many IPv4 addresses and no network number, no ASN, no V6? So it's obvious what the game is. It's about the interest of hijacking numbers out somewhere else uh, to use. And that one, uh, <laughs> I don't think Africa or the world will want to see that. Thank you, Ni. Uh, we, we have less than one minute per person. Iria, please, two words of conclusion. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, basically, I think we, uh, we our consensus to be we need technical expertise uh, in every discussion about policy. So we need to have uh, people who know how to solve the problems, implement the solutions, and we also need the input from civil society in understanding the human right trade off uh, before moving up uh, to regulation. So otherwise, we may end with bigger problems or a different set of problems than the ones we are trying to solve. Thank you. Lee, please. Just to set the right tone for the ending of this, when we've asked uh, in global surveys, Given all the problems that you are now talking about, we're asking questions about in our surveys, um, how hard would it be and how willing would you be to give up the internet? And there is almost universal, under no circumstances would I give it up. So we've done a pretty good job uh, by the consumer behavior and consumer sentiment. Thank you. Jane? Don't discount your voice in helping keep the internet open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy. Make sure the multi-stakeholder model and the IGF continue. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, I want to give the last word to Olivier Crépin Leblanc. If I am here, it's because he is not here. It would have been much better than me to run this meeting. But Olivier, go ahead. The host has unmuted me. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you to everyone who has uh, participated as a panelist and also as a, a participant uh, uh, in, in uh, this discussion. The Dynamic Coalition has discussions throughout the year. The work is ongoing. If you're interested in joining the uh, Dynamic Coalition, you can go onto the Internet Governance Forum website, go into intersessional uh, work where the Dynamic Coalitions are all listed, uh, click on the one on core internet values, and you can join the mailing list. Uh, there's no uh, membership fee or anything like that, but we do take our work very seriously. It's extremely important. Uh, we will make a report out of this, uh, of today's session, and of course it will be 
taken into account in the IGF messages for Kyoto. So thanks very much. And thanks, of course, uh, to all those people that have helped with organizing this session. Thank you very much, Olivier, Alessandro, and all the speakers. And the meeting is uh, closed now. Bye-bye.